try to get some stuff moved around here. <clears throat> well, my name is uh, Jim Pizarowitz. I live in uh, Montrose, Colorado these days. And uh, I'm a caver. I've been involved with exploring caves for over 60 years. I grew up in Minnesota, which is in a, a really big caving state. But uh, I've traveled all over the world. Last time I looked at my database, I have uh, been uh, in, in like something around 5,000 caves from all over the world. And, uh, and a member and fellow of the National Speleological Society. And so for many, many years, uh, caves, caves and exploring caves has been my life. I was the uh, editor for the journal Cave and Car Studies uh, for 11 years and uh, just spent a lot of time underground work at national parks with caves, uh, Wind Cave National Park. I worked in Minnesota for the Minnesota DNR at a cave, mystery cave there. And uh, <clears throat> a long career of caves. And after my knees uh, wore out, I got more involved with, uh, with photography and wildflowers. And I have a couple books out about uh, wildflowers and, 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 and such. So hopefully everybody can see what's going on. I just want to say before I go any further that this year is the International Year of Caves and Cars. So all over the world this year, uh, cave, cave scientists, speleologists, uh, cave researchers and such are, um, are, um, are uh, celebrating caves and the research and such related to caves. Okay. Well, how did I end up in Yellowstone? Back in 1988, Jim, the big Yellowstone. Yes. If you're intending to share, we don't have a screen yet. Oh, you don't have a screen yet. Huh. I don't see share sound. I got a little thing that's here, a blurb on top. I just I selected view speaker and I'm putting them up here. Okay. I'm sorry, Fred, but we're looking for a screen, not speaker. Okay. Okay. I, I'm not sharing, huh? No, you're not. No, I haven't. I have a thing here. That's on Jim, top does he of my, be, Jim, I think you may have to be my slides to share. And it, and it says no, share. It was a share button. Okay. My mouse is not allowing me to go there. <laughs> We were testing earlier. And it's... Let's try this. There you go. Your screen okay. has come up. Okay. Let's see. So you see stuff now. <laughs> we have you. You are up and okay. running. Okay. So caving beneath the land of the geysers. Actually, this is up at the mammoth area. So I guess there isn't geysers per se there. And as I said, International Year of Cave and, and uh, Karst. Uh, Karst is landforms where the water runs under underwater, base, or underground, basically. But this is a big, big uh, push by all the people that are doing uh, research and conservation and groundwater and, uh, and all those sorts of issues. OK. How did I get involved in all of this? In 1988, the big Yellowstone fire started. At the time, I was working at Wind Cave National Park in, in South Dakota. It was a dry year all over the West. <clears throat> uh, the Black Hills had one of the biggest wildflower or wildfires season that they've ever had. And that year, the fires started in, in Yellowstone. And I think all of you that live in the Yellowstone area know all about these fires. It started June 14th, lasted until about November 18th burned almost 800,000 acres, about a third, a little bit better than a third of the park. And a major, major event. You know, the fires continued burning throughout the summer, you know, burned right into some of the infrastructure of the parks and such. And, uh, you know, hundreds, thousands of firefighters and, and other fire people converged on Yellowstone at that time. Well, I was working at Wind Cave National Park that summer and myself and another ranger by the name of Jim Nepstad, the two of us had started using computers to map the cave system 
at Wind Cave. Now, Wind Cave is one of the largest cave systems in the world. Uh, right now, it's it is I think the the eighth, no, the seventh longest caves in the cave in the world. About 154 miles of cave passageways. Uh, in 1988, there was about oh, 60 to 70 miles of cave mapped out, and uh, <clears throat> Jim and I were trying to take all the survey data, put it all in one place, use computer programs to develop the coordinates for all the different parts of the cave, and then allow, uh, allow computer mathematical formulas to basically close all the loops of, for all the different surveys in the cave. And we were using a program called um, AutoCAD at the time, and we we're using that because, it, because, it, because in 1988, there was no GIS programs out there. And somehow, word got to Yellowstone when the fire got going that Wind Cave National Park had digital topographic maps of Yellowstone. And so they sent a message over to the super, superintendent, my boss, and said, send those guys out that are working on all this cave mapping stuff. And, uh, and have them bring all their equipment with them. So we got, got our orders to do that and loaded up a van with computers and digitizing tablets and all this stuff and drove out to Yellowstone to help them map out what was going on in the caves, well, of, or uh, in the park with the fire. Well, I don't know why they thought we had digital uh, typographic maps of Yellowstone because Yellowstone didn't even have digital topographic maps. But we arrived out there at the park and uh, checked in with all the other fire firefighting people kind of stuff. And we set up all of our equipment and they said, well, go to work. And I said, well, we don't have any of these maps that, you're, that you think that we have. And they went, well, I thought you had these maps. I said, no, we don't have these maps. So we actually ended up working with the fire, the fire people and the soil scientist people and a bunch of other folks creating maps of the of the fire and where, where the greatest effects of those fires were. And in, in fact, by the time I left after the fires were, were out, <clears throat> most of those maps became the basis of the maps that National Geographic used to uh, put out their National Geographic uh, um, uh, issues that dealt with the Yellowstone fire. So as, as the fire started to wind down, you know, I could spend more time over at the headquarters there uh, in the Mammoth area. And one day I walked in and talked with some of the secretaries and people in the offices there. And I said, what are those caves out in front of the, the building here? And they said to me, what caves? I said, what do you mean what caves? They're just right out the, if you go out to the window and look out, you'll see caves out there. And so I, I brought some of the staff out and we looked at out the window and out there were caves. And not only were there caves there, they had fences around them so people wouldn't fall into these caves. So I said, well, I'm interested in these caves. And uh, is it possible to get a permit to go in and explore and map these caves? Which I, and I thought that was sort of strange that you know, no one seemed to even think it, that there was a cave there to begin with. So we left, we left Yellowstone, headed back to Wind Cave. And and so for a number of years, I cut contracting the park saying, can I get a permit to explore the caves there? And the reply I was, was always getting is like, it's too dangerous for people to go into those caves. Uh, there's, there's too much car carbon uh, monoxide in the caves. There's toxic gases and such. We've had people go into the caves and they would need to be rescued because they were overcome by the toxic gases or other sorts of things. And so we're not going to let anybody in these caves. But I mean, I sent messages every year, every couple of years to the park for 10 or 11 years asking for permission to go explore caves that there in the, the mammoth area. Well, in the meantime, they were saying, no, no, no. So I just continued doing the kind of stuff that I was doing with other caves. And of course, at that time, the big cave I was working on was down in Mexico called Cueva de Villaluz, near the town of Tapi Hulapa. This cave has an auto, auto, auto ke, ke, chemo autotropic uh, ecosystem in the cave, runs all the way from bacteria in the cave to bats that never leave the cave. And it's all based upon uh, microbes chewing up uh, sulfur and a bunch of other chemicals in the cave. This is a real interesting place to be in. 
you get water dripping out of the season, uh, the, the ceiling of the cave uh, filled with hydrogen or uh, sulfuric acid. The pH of the sulfuric acid is less than 0.1. Super, super strong acid, eats holes through the suits that you're wearing and such. Uh, hydrogen sulfide or H2S uh, concentrations, 200 parts per million or more, oftentimes low oxygen levels, less than 10%, high, high CO2 levels of 10% of or more, and just a nasty place to be. Uh, I've had several people that I've taken to the cave tell me that it was the worst cave, cave they've ever been in. But, uh, but the biology that goes on in the cave is really, really interesting. So, so for a number of years, we've figured out the ways that we can travel and exist in a cave like this, do the kind of research. Most of the research was supported by NASA because they're using the results of this stuff to redesign the biological probes that they're sending off to other planets. Because at the time, myself and other people first got into the cave here, some of the NASA people said, gee, if we what are you, we're using some of our our biological probes came into the cave, it would tell them that there was nothing living here. <laughs> and obviously there, there was. So this research continued for, it's, it is still an ongoing project. And this is one of the caves and many others that I was involved with exploring between 1988 and, and, uh, and 1990, 1999. Well, in 1999, the National Speleological Society had their annual convention in Filer, uh, Idaho. And I went to the convention to present uh, papers on what I, what I was doing. And a person came up to me uh, after my presentation and said, oh, I'm really interested in this, but would you be interested in coming over to Yellowstone to go in the caves? And I said, I've been trying to get into Yellowstone for 10, 11 years to go look at their caves. And he said, well, I can arrange for you to do that. And his name was Steve Miller. And I said, go back to Yellowstone and uh, you know, get permission and I'll, I'll get a, together a team and we will come out to look at these caves. And, uh, and so later that fall, Steve contacted me and says, yes, you have permission to come out here. So I got, got a couple of the people that were involved with me in exploring the caves in, uh, in Mexico. And we headed out for Yellowstone. We had a two week window to be there. And basically the two weeks before they were gonna close down the park uh, was time for us to be there exploring, exploring caves in uh, November of 1999. Oops. When we got there, one of the first caves that they were interested in, in us taking a look at was a cave that they referred to as Jeweled Cave. This cave was discovered back in, in, or there was documentation of somebody being in the cave as early as 1875. And the park was interested in the cave because they had some records, but they had found and lost the location of this cave several times. So they said, We're, we'd be interested in you guys going out there and finding the location for the cave, you know, GPS it for us, and then you know, do an inventory and such in the cave. So. The team got together and headed out to look for Jewel Cave. The people on the expedition were Abby Wines, that's the person in the very front of the, the, the list here. Uh, today she is like essentially assistant superintendent at uh, Death Valley National Park. Steve Miller behind her and in the back uh, Dave Lester, a caver uh, from, uh, from Denver. Well, we hiked around for a while and indeed we found the entrance of the cave. So here's the entrance of the cave. Abby's looking in, into the cave. Dave is down there scoping out what the entrance looked at. But one of the things that you have to worry about in caves in Yellowstone or caves like Via Luz is do you have the right kind of safety equipment and the right protocol for exploring caves that perhaps could have toxic environments uh, and, and other things like that. So let's Let's look at Dave. Dave is going to give us a little safety briefing on the kind of equipment that we're going to use to hopefully safely explore all of these caves. Yeah, you're recorded. Why don't you, <laughs> Dave? Why don't you give us a lowdown of the safety? <laughs> Dave, why don't you give us a lowdown of the safety equipment we're using for the cave here? We have a number of safety devices along with us. Filters, which will filter out 
certain toxic gases, but it won't do us any good for low oxygen or high carbon dioxide concentrations. We have a couple of different kinds of analyzers. This one's called a quadrant. It's a four gas analyzer capable of reading the oxygen concentrations. Depending upon the sensors that are in here, it will also read hydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, combustible gases, and so on. This one set up right now, we'll be looking mainly to start with at the O2 and the uh, some of the other gases. One of our other analyzers, it's called an Omni, a little larger version. This one has four sensors in it right now also, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and sulfur dioxide, as well as combustibles. We're taking them into the cave and being very much aware of what they're telling us. They will alarm and give us a warning if either the oxygen concentrations are low or if any of the hazardous gas concentrations are high. Turn them on, get them going. What other stuff do you have there for if the oxygen levels go low or the uh, carbon dioxide we, we goes high? Other backup things. Occasionally these kinds of concentrations will not be steady state, but rather will change on us while we're in a cave. Should that unfortunate eventuality occur, we have spare airs, which are breathing air, which will give us approximately five minutes of air to breathe by taking off the protective cover, putting it in our mouth and simply breathing. The, uh, the device is designed to save our lives if there's not enough oxygen or if there's too much other hazardous or toxic gas in the cave. Well equipped for such eventualities. Hopefully we won't need any of them. It looks like a great cave and who knows what's in there until we, until we go in. Alright, thank you Dave. You know, let's see here. So our protocol is to have all of this equipment with us. Before we head down into the cave, we lower a set of instruments in the cave to tell us if it's it's safe for us to go in without having breathing air. We were breathing on the breathing air, and uh, if there's toxic gases, that we have the right filters in the masks that we're going to have. So you can see right behind Dave, there's a piece of webbing. We tied tied some of our our monitors on on the webbing, lowered them into the cave, and then we can pull them out and see what the readings were when they were down at the bottom of the the drop here. And when we did that in this particular cave at this time, the oxygen was fine, the carbon, di the carbon dioxide levels were low, there were no other toxic gases and such. So we then grabbed up our, the rest of our equipment and headed off into the cave. Now it is, it is the, the ethics of, of cave explorers today is that as we go into the cave, we survey the cave as we go through the cave. So we have a measuring tape and tape from this point to point in the cave. We have a compass to get the bearings from one point in the cave to the next. We have a clinometer and measure the, whether the cave is going down or up or steady. And then as we walk through the cave or crawl through the cave as the case may be, we have graph paper. We're drawing pictures of what, what the cave looks like as we're going along through the cave uh, based upon our, our measurements that we're taking. We have a protractor we're doing an inventory of the things that we find inside the cave. So here's Dave, he's down inside the cave here. You can see attached to his helmet, there's a yellow booklet there that is, a, that is the survey book that's recording all the information that we need to make a map of the cave. Here's Steve in the cave. When we were, coming, we were in the cave and we saw a bunch of uh, you know, crust inside the cave. Uh, there's some sort of travertine crust and uh, a little bit of um, uh, 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 stuff called moon milk, sort of a soft, soft, um, wet sort of looking uh, uh, stuff that you find on, on ceilings and places in the cave. Here, Steve is pointing out some of the cave, cave popcorn or sort of crusty stuff on some of the some of the rocks inside the cave. Here, you can see in this spot where the crust is actually coming off of the wall of the cave. Uh, here. You can see where somebody else had, had previously been in the cave because here's a section of moon milk here that somebody's put their their dirty hand onto the uh, the moon milk that was on the on the wall of the cave there and then some bubbles some some of the formations look like little bubbles uh, uh, in the cave uh, as we continued through the cave 
And then in some parts of the cave, there was no crusting on the walls. And here Steve is looking at some of the crusting. You can see the layers uh, uh, in the picture here. There's another picture of Steve in the cave. You can see he's looking at the gas monitor. You can see on his side, he has his spare air there and he has a measuring tape uh, there. Uh, we, have, we had sort of funny names for our instruments. Uh, we, we called uh, our various uh, 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 gas monitoring things uh, blinkies because as you walk through the cave, they're constantly there's different colored lights that are flashing off and on. We need to uh, be aware of those kinds of things. And some of the some of the other instruments we call clunkies because they're big and clunky kinds of instruments to be carrying around. And you can see most of these instruments are pretty pricey. They're really not meant for being dragged around in caves. Uh, fortunately, this is not a wet cave, but they're you can't like put them in a waterproof container because you have to have all the monitors open to the air of the cave. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to do the, the monitoring and such that we want to do. In the furthest parts of this particular cave, we found bison bones. And at the end of our trip, we end up with a map of the cave. So here's a map of, of Jewel Cave. Uh, uh, we usually don't put uh, the GPS coordinates on the maps. We told the park where they, where they were just so that other people won't use our maps to find caves and such. And then there's various notes. And so it says, you know, the entrance is vertical. You need a 25 foot hand line to get into the cave. There's crust, there are various kinds of animal droppings in the cave, uh, signatures in some parts of the cave. We saw some bats and that kind of stuff. And so all that information is recorded on the map that we produce of the cave. Well, at the end of a trip through the cave, we have, to, we have to go back and take all of our data and reduce it. So here's Abby's looking at our, all of our notes here, trying to figure out uh, you know, what the map is gonna look like of the cave. And uh, also you know, the typical scientific group to get together and have a discussion of the things that we saw in different parts of the cave and why those things were in the various parts of the cave that they were. We also, oops, where did we miss something there. Oh, let's go back to this one here. Okay. So when we get back to analyze our data, we have all of our monitors and the monitors are doing continuous report recording of all the various gases and such, which we got back to the base camp, downloaded all that stuff on our computers and we can look at the gases and the results the gas Instantly line. on the screen appears the graph of what we had in the cave from 4.24.50 p.m. to 5.00.50 p.m. So this is a 36-minute segment in the cave. And you can see the interesting stuff starts happening. This is the hydrogen sulfide. Look down here. We actually had some H2S peaks. Really? All the way up to 100 parts per million. Now that would really astound me if that happened today. I don't remember it, but it says here at 4.56 it happened. And between 4.48 and 5 o'clock we had some really weird things going on in this cave, Jim. Really? We got CO up to 2 ppm, I remember when that happened. And the oxygen at the same time dropped down to about 20.5 sort of a precursor to that stuff. That might have been about the mm. time you guys smelled the strange stuff. It too. might have been. So this this really shows some something important for going into caves like the caves there at uh, Yellowstone. We saw the same kind of results at some of the caves that we work with uh, down in Mexico. Everything is going really fine for a while. You know, in this particular cave there, the, the hydrogen, uh, hydrogen sulfide, H2S and the, and the carbon Monoxide and the oxygen levels are pretty good. And suddenly it's almost like the cave burps or belches. And when it does that, suddenly you can get these big spikes in some of these toxic gases. Now, now H2S, if you sort of look at the, the OSHA rules for being in an H2S environment, it says any, any, any more than 10 parts per million, you should be wearing gas masks in the cave. And we can see here, everything is going really, really, uh, 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 smooth and suddenly there's 100 parts per million, which is starting to get very toxic. Similarly, you see a, 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 
a trough of oxygen co corresponds to these other gases. And in some of the caves we saw in, in Via Luce, it's like the cave belches and a bunch of gases are released into the cave those gases eat up all the oxygen and then suddenly there's all these toxic gases. And uh, fortunately in this particular case, these were just these momentary kinds of things. But in other, other toxic gas caves I've been in, they will suddenly rise and stay at that very high level, which is why you have all this, this other safety equipment that we're carrying with us uh, as we continue our work, working our way through the, through the cave. Let's see. Okay. Another cave that we found that, that the park was not aware of was like a, a sort of a tectonic cave that we found while walking along the surface. Uh, we reported this cave and, and the, the park was not aware of it. So they said, well, get, you know, can you explore this cave? And we said, yes. So the first thing we did, we're right along a trail and uh, here's Abby GPSing the location of where the cave, cave is. And there is the cave, we looked down the cave did the same sort of thing that we did on, uh, on Jewel Cave. <clears throat> we lowered instruments into the cave. We saw that there was no toxic gases or anything we need to be concerned about. And here's Dave uh, uh, getting on rappel to go down this crack. It dropped down about, uh, about 20 meters, it's about 60 feet. And here he's get, getting over the edge and down into the cave. And Abby's there looking down at him and he's saying, Dave is shouting up and says, no, no, we're not getting any bad readings on any of our instruments. And so they're starting to chimney along the side of this, uh, this chasm. And then Steve rappelled down and, and Steve and Dave were down the bottom of, the, of the, 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 the chasm here, going back and forth along the edges, seeing if there were any other cave passageways. Well, while down there, Steve uh, happened to drop one of our meters and fell about 20 feet down the, to the bottom and they eventually got it, got it out. But uh, after that, we, we were down one of our, our toxic gas meters and uh, we were very unhappy because uh, that was a pretty expensive meter uh, to lose right there. The next cave we explored was McCartney's cave. This is the cave I originally saw when I was at the park in 1988. So I was in that building right behind that, uh, where the where the elk is, when I looked out and saw this this cave out there, and asked the people at the park, "What about that cave?" And they said, "What caves?" But this is the cave that I originally seen, and so I've, so for many years, for like a decade, I was wondering, "What in the world is down in that cave?" And so Abby is tying off a rope here. The entrance is a little bit of a drop, and so she gets the rope tied off. You can see the rope coming down and goes into a big room, goes down and down and down and down and down. And then it looks like it doesn't go on, but if you go around the corner, there's a little hole and that leads to a, a second drop into the cave. So here is the second drop going into the cave. And uh, let me give you here, second drop. And Dave is gonna, we're gonna work his way down, down the second drop. He's on his rope, he has a repelling device, a, a pencil stop repelling device. You can see again, he has his uh, survey book in his helmet there. He's using a carbide lamp. Most, most cables these days do not use carbide lamp, they use LED electric lights. And this is a short drop, maybe about uh, about five meters or so, about 15 feet. He's down. So this is the, from the bottom looking up at the, where that second drop goes. Another shot looking up. And there's Dave standing at the bottom. But there's a big debris pile and that continues down and goes into a, a, a largish room with uh, lots of banded uh, rock in it. And let's take a look at, at that.
Oops, oh, there we go for light. So Dave is standing next to the some of the nice banding. You can also see how this is sloping down along here. And again, this is all this geyserite or synther stuff. Very, very different than you find in in most other caves. It's quite colorful on up in through here. You can see some of the iron influence as far as the coloration is concerned of the banding and then coming down the center is a lot whiter and lighter and then dark bands here from different chemical action and aging as the uh, surface is corroded on its face various colorations here with different mineral contents as these layers have been laid down and exposed to aging yeah not like a normal limestone cave that's for sure and this stuff is real punky Quite soft, very, uh, very, very uh, low density material. I mean, just when you climb on it, it, you have to be very, very careful. It's very, it breaks very, very easily. Don't trust any handholds in this stuff. All right, I think that does it. Got it. Yes. Well, one thing about this is that people have since told me since we first went into the cave here that this is not geyserite or synther. Uh, the water in this area is, is much too cold for that to be the case. But the main point is that a lot of the, the crust or the limestone in this area is really friable. You sort of you try to grab onto it and put some weight on it. It just breaks apart. So it's very, very difficult climbing around because you're afraid that all your handholds and footholds would just break off at, at, at almost any time. But uh, it was sort of exciting finally getting our way down to the bottom of the cave here, especially since I've been thinking about what was down in this cave for like 10 or 11 years. And finally, after finished mapping the cave that, that day, uh, we didn't get out of the cave until after it was dark. And so here, here we are working our way back up to the entrance and out the entrance of the cave because it took us all day long to take all the measurements and do all the documentation and everything for this particular cave. And so here, here's what the, the, the small map of the cave looks like. You can see the entrance there, it has a fence around it, a little drop down, a big slope going down and down and down, finally through some rocks and then down to the final chamber, which you can repel down into, goes around the corner. And that's where all that very nice uh, banding uh, was located in that particular part of the cave. Another cave we looked at was a cave which we didn't name, but it was right out in front of the visitor center area as well. And we walked up to this cave. You could see when we were there, steam coming out of the cave. Here's Dave taking a look down in, into this particular cave. And it's like, okay, let's get our equipment ready to go in. So, a video, okay, there we go. The nice thing about these caves that have no known no known name for this cave. Places that tie the rope yeah. off on yeah. It's totally overhung drop. And we're getting ready to, to drop our instrumentation in the cave. So in this particular case, we dropped the instrumentation in the cave and they said, whoa, uh, you gotta be careful this particular cave. The oxygen levels in the room at the bottom of this entrance drop were really low. It was less than 15% oxygen, really high in carbon dioxide, 8% or higher, sometimes 10% uh, uh, CO2 level in the cave. So in this particular cave, before we even entered the cave, we needed to get all of our safety equipment on because it was gonna be just one nasty thing after another as we continued into this particular cave.
So let's take another look at another video here, heading down into this unnamed cave. Oops. Dave is getting ready to go down. He has a double set of spare airs. We also have the rope rigged so that if it's necessary, we can pull on it and just it's set up as a haul system. I'll haul them back out again. So he's going to enter the cave, two spare airs with him, and he's actually breathing on one of the spare airs as he goes down, repelling down into the cave. So he's heading down to the bottom of the first drop. And once he gets down there, we told him, don't get off of the rope because maybe you'll pass out for some reason and we, we need to be set to pull you out. And so when, when he headed, when he repelled down, he was everything was set up so up on the surface, we had a haul system to haul him back out of the cave if he sort of lost consciousness. Well, he didn't lose consciousness, but he went down a little side passageway at the bottom of this, this entrance drop and it got immediately really hot. So the temperature readings just a short distance away from the entrance chamber was 55 degrees Celsius. It was 131 degrees Fahrenheit. So very, very hot. And uh, Dave said, as soon as he got into that passageway, he was so hot, he just wanted to get out of, out of there, given he had all this equipment on and he's breathing off of the spare air and everything already. Oops. So he immediately got hooked up, get his uh, ascending equipment hooked up, climbing out of the cave there, up to the surface and finally out of the cave. We didn't map in that cave because we had to have a, a team of a couple people and at this point, we're getting pretty far into our, our, our cave trip. I think we only had 10 spare airs. We didn't have any way of refilling them. And uh, we didn't want to sort of continue any exploration where we're getting sort of dicey as far as the amount of air that we have if we, if we need it. The next cave we went to was another cave that the park knew about, but didn't have any good documentation of it. This is a cave called uh, Devil's Kitchen. Uh, <clears throat> Back in the 30s, I think all the way up into maybe the 50s, they actually had a ladder in this cave so visitors could come down and visit the cave. Uh, they stopped doing that a number of years ago because uh, uh, they were concerned about uh, the, the, the bad air conditions in the cave. Here's Dave and Abby looking down uh, into the cave and uh, we repelled down. It was about, uh, about 15, 15 meter drop down into the cave. Dave's down one of the side passageways. You can see some graffiti on the walls of the cave left behind by the visitors, which were just allowed to go into the cave, cave on their own. There are a couple different pools of water in the cave that we call this the foamy pool. And this pool looked like it was very, very deep. We didn't really have anything to sort of plumb the depth, depth of this pool. But when you're next to the pool here, it's very, very warm. So about 50.3 degrees Celsius, that's about 122 degrees Fahrenheit. So you're in the cave here and it, although it's it's moderately cool outside, once you're in the cave here for any time whatsoever, you're just sort of, you know, like sweating like a pig. Uh, Steve is looking at the second pool that we found in the cave. We call this the crystal pool. And it wasn't quite as hot as the foam pool. This one is uh, about 41 degrees uh, uh, Celsius, about 100, 106 degrees Fahrenheit. So very warm uh, uh, a cave here because of the water, the hot water that's inside the cave. Now, uh, after a time in the cave, uh, Abby here is starting to climb out, working her way out. And here is here is a, 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 a map of the cave. You can see the different different pools in the cave, information about the, the water temperatures, pHs, you know, little little bit below. Uh, 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 normal here, so so uh, little around around six six pH, 
and uh, and there's steam coming out of some of the cracks and such that we we found inside the cave as well. We also did some surface hiking. You know, after after we did these four caves, which took a bunch of our time to be, work on that, we hiked along the surface, found very interesting things. If you're a caver, you're always interested in holes in the ground. You know, even if you're they're too small for you to crawl into, and here Abby's looking down one of these holes. Here's a vent with a hole we sort of peered down. <clears throat> and then there were these, these other sort of surface kinds of caves. And although these, are, these kinds of places, I, I, I can see a visitor maybe wanting to go down there and investigate it. Some of these, once we got down in, inside of these, even though they're very easy to get into, you know, the, the oxygen levels started to drop, the carbon dioxide uh, levels got almost to the point where, there's, where there, they would be toxic, those two things varying. And so again, I think before people are allowed to go into these kinds of caves, they need to have the right kind of equipment to monitor the gases and the other sorts of things and be prepared for the, for the conditions in some of these caves. This is a cave that the park <clears throat> had, had a note on it that says uh, this high carbon dioxide. You could stand about 10 feet away from the cave and the carbon dioxide <clears throat> levels would read, read about 5%, 6%, 7%, depending upon which way the wind was blowing. So it definitely needed to be careful uh, uh, around these kinds of areas. We found some little, little salt like uh, surface caves with a formation of so little stalactite formations. And some very interesting little streams coming out of the, the, the limestone and travertine with, with obviously very interesting bio, biological stuff going on. You know, as a caver, I look at all holes and say, I'm interested in going in and seeing what's down in that hole. And I look at this hole and it's like, oh, it looked very enticing. You wouldn't even have to, to squeeze your way into the cave. It's got steam coming out. But uh, the question is, should I go in to do that? And the answer to that is like, well, it depends. It depends upon whether you have the right equipment, the correct, the, the correct proce procedures and such to use that equipment in a cave like this, know when, when it is safe and when it is not safe. And, uh, and after you do that, then it's up to you to make the decision, can you safely explore this particular cave with the equipment and the team of people that you have with you? And all over the Yellowstone area, you found lots and lots of places like this. I would like to go back and visit all of these places. Well, finally, our, our time at Yellowstone came to an end. Uh, Steve went back to, so, to where he was living there at the park. Abby made her way back. She was working at Great Basin at the time. Dave had an unfortunate uh, uh, meeting with the bison when he drove into the park and uh, hit one of the bisons and, uh, and his car needed to be towed back to Denver. It ended up that it, his car was totaled because the whole front suspension of his car, when it hit, hit the bison, it, it literally crystallized everything and it fell apart <laughs> and there was no way of getting it fixed. Well, I, I always want to say thanks to all the rangers and staff at Yellowstone. You know, Yellowstone Park was very accommodating to us when we were working in areas close to where visitors would see us, even though it was sort of the end of the summer. They always provided us with a law enforcement ranger and an interpreter uh, who we, we told what we were doing, why we're doing it, uh, what sort of a safety equipment we had. So if visitors came up to ask, what are you guys doing? Those, uh, the rangers that were there could uh, go over and, and interface with the visitors while we continued the work that we were working on. All right. I guess any questions? I guess we get, somebody's got to open up questions. Jim? <laughs> oh, very good there, Jim. And if there's questions, someone can unmute themselves and uh, throw a question out to us. Silence. I'll bet there's a question or two. What's a tectonic? Oh, that's that, that's a cave basically caused by um, ah, uh, earth movements, like earthquakes and that kind of stuff will crack the earth. And you know, there, you know, so you're going to have a, a place where you can go down underground in those those kinds of places. So it's like an earth crack. 
So it's not, it's not like dissolved out like most caves. But, but I've been in some, some caves where you go down the bottom of the tectonic area and because they start to collect water and if you end up getting water flowing through those areas and if the water is slightly acidic, you can start to get caves being dissolved at the bottom, uh, bottoms of tectonic spots. Does that answer your question? <laughs> This is Carol. Yeah. I once heard something about the water that comes out at Mammoth Hot Springs right. comes from down at Norris. Okay. Did you get into any of that area where that water is flowing or is that yeah. not true? Yeah, we only we only had a permit to to look at the caves in the Mammoth area. You know, so I mean we could go down and be a tourist and look at all of the you know geysers and whatever else, but we did not have a permit to go into those areas. You know, at least as far as going into the caves in that area. But I mean, you know, there's there's hasn't been hardly any cave, you know, exploration stuff by by people that are, can go into a cave and document it in the Yellowstone area. You know, if you go to the sort of the the west and south of, of, of Mammoth Hot Springs, there's a lot of Madison limestone run, running through that area. And you know, like limestone is the typical uh, kind of rock and such that you find caves in. And even though there's a bunch of it there, basically I've never found too much written up about uh, looking at caves there. And I guess you know, you, you're gonna need to go in and, and talk with the park officials and say, I wanna get a permit. But I would say any cave there in the Yellowstone area, the park people need to say, I don't wanna say, they should not say you can't go into those caves, but you have to have the right equipment, the right, the, the right, right experience to do these caves because potentially any of those caves could have toxic gases uh, and toxic conditions. So you need to be able to have the equipment to monitor, monitor those kinds of things. You saw on the, on the one meter that we were, we were metering these gases, the gases are just flat steady. And then suddenly it's like, this is a big spike. You know, when that, that H2S spike hit, it went up to hundred parts per million. 10 is considered you should exit the area. You know, and now you're talking about 10 times that amount. And fortunately, it was just momentarily. But you know, if you don't have the equipment to monitor that and then have the equipment to, like gas masks to put on, and then the oxygen bottles, if you need it for that, well, you just die. <laughs> you know, so 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 I think the caves can be safely explored but with the right, right kind of equipment and the right kind of protocols and people that will follow the right pro protocols too, so. But I think it's interesting, you know, you know the typical way that, that, that cavers figure out where the water is flowing is they go into an area where they think the water from here goes to some other spot and they pour in various kinds of dyes and then they see if the dye comes out at the other spot. Now, typically they will use dyes like fluorescein and rhodamine, which are colored dyes. You know, they pour it in here, turns the water green or red, and it comes out over here green or red. I don't think Yellowstone would like that. You know, because <laughs> all of a sudden the visitors say, why is this guys are all green, you know, kind of thing. But I mean, there's other, other ways where you can dye, dye trace. They can use uh, various kinds of spores. You know, so they have spores, which you can dump in here and, and then collect water at some other point and then take that water and examine that under a microscope to see if any of those spores, which you dumped over here, here show, show up at that other location. And you know, if you can't see them, you know, there's not a visible kind of a thing, but there's a way that you could, you could check those sorts of things out. And cavers do, you know, cavers and hydrologists and speleologists do that kind of research all the time. So that would be an interesting project for somebody, maybe. I think you'd have to have a pretty good reason why you think the water from here ends up over there. But it can be done. Another question I had was, it looked like with all that layering, that kind of calls out for doing some dating or mm -hmm. understanding how long it takes. Is there any of that in your research? We, we haven't done any of that there. You know, and, and uh, speleothems are the stuff, cave formations and such, you know, like speleologists date, date things like stalactites and stalagmites and crusts and that kind of stuff all the time. You know, they use 
radioactive decay kinds of stuff, and they're able to to get give you dates on on some of those sorts of things. So, uh, Jim, one of the folks who says uh, she's a geyser researcher refers to the Norris Mammoth Corridor, a network of faults running between the two areas, and there is fluid flow from Norris down okay. to Mammoth, and yes, that is known there. Okay. And another person has asked the question, you mentioned the cave with bats that never leave the cave. Do you know anything about those bats in that cave you were working in? Uh, yeah, um, there's actually, a, it's, it's an interesting story. When we first started exploring that cave, uh, the, the, the team that were in the cave, uh, you know, not, not only having to worry about all these, these gases and such, and uh, but they're in the cave and they're complaining that there's so many bats flying around. And so I said, well, let's let's return to the cave at night because the bats are going to fly out of the cave, you know, to go collect insects and such out of the cave. And we went back and did the mapping at night, and there was just as many bats in the cave at, at night that there were in the day. And we actually went around to a bunch of the entrances of the cave, that, of that particular cave. And at night, you didn't see any bats flying out of the cave. So the bats spent all their entire life inside the cave because there was enough insects and such flying around inside the cave, living off of the, 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 the mi microbes and other, you know, the whole food chain uh, rising out of the cave that they didn't have to go out of the cave. So most of those bats, we actually saw some vampire bats in that, in that particular cave. And I think maybe some of them would go out of the cave because they're going to go out looking for some blood here and there from the, the cattle and such in the entrance. But most of the caves it looked like they were red bats, and I think maybe one or two other kinds of bats. But they basically didn't go out of the cave. That's why I said it's one of the interesting things about that particular cave is that the chemoautotropic system in the cave goes all the way from microbes all the way up to mammals, and. Uh, and, and everything in between, there's fish in the cave, there's beetles, there's all these other kinds of animals in the cave too, but none of them ever even have to leave the cave because everything they need is in the cave. So that's sort of a really interesting, all living off of bacteria breaking down sulfur and such. Any Anybody else questions? thinking of a good question? Well, if not, thank you. <laughs> well, I want to thank you, Jim. That's an incredible presentation. I think everybody's just kind of satiated with the knowledge they've learned about. I'm getting a couple of good uh, signs from people. Yeah, that was very good. Um, uh, thanks for coming up here from Montrose, Colorado. We wow. definitely appreciate having you make that long trip. Oh, this was Zoom. Uh, <laughs> but... Uh, well, I yeah, I will say I, I, I sent to, to Jim a um, uh, PDF of an article that I wrote about this, and I think he's, he has it. So you can contact him to either get the article or uh, get a copy of it from him, I guess. Those people that would wish to copy the article, you, of course, have received a email notice of the meeting. Respond to me um, with that email notice, and I can uh, email down the PDF to you. Okay. Well, don't want to cut off conversation, so I'm going to leave this open for a while. And if anybody just wants to talk to someone else or last call for questions, though, before we turn this over to regular uh, social use, last call for questions, please. All right. That being the case, so I, I turn it Bozeman. over to social. Go ahead, Doug. I live in Bozeman. I'm an NSS fellow as well, Jim. Yeah. How do I continue your work? Who do I talk to? Well, you know, like I got in, I got permission to do that work because Steve Miller was working there at the park. And like okay. I said, I ran in, you know, I had asked, asked for permission a number of times over, over, you know, 10 or 11 years to come out and I kept getting, no, 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 it's too dangerous, blah, 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 blah. And when I contacted Steve, 
because I saw him at the NSS convention. He says, oh, I think I can go back to the park and get permission. And I mean, I literally got back from the back from the NSS convention in Filer, and a day or two later, I got a call from him and says, yeah, I got you permission. So I guess you just need to talk with uh, people. I think the main thing is convincing them that you have the right equipment, you know, to go in and do these caves. You know, like some of those instruments, like the quadrants and, and such, they're a couple thousand dollars and you, for the instrument. And then you have to put a sensor in them because it because you can you can buy all different kinds of sensors and every one of the sensors is a different amount. And then there's a lot of calibration that you need to do on those. You know, so you use them for a while and then they need to be re recalibrated. And one of the reasons that, that I like having Dave along because he's sort of an engineer and could do the recalibration on all those instruments. Exactly. It's sort of like having a musical instrument, you know, like you have to retune it. And so you want to make sure you have it. You want a list of the, the stuff that we use. That's an awful sound. I'm going to remute everybody for a second here. We're getting a lot of interference from one of the listeners. And then please open your mic again to talk. So Doug, if you got additional follow-up, please come forward and Jim, open your mic. No, I think that helps. I can reach out to Dave. I know Dave and uh, find out the equipment that he had and, and what he recommends for modern, uh, you know, was yeah, it I mean, maybe 20 uh, years later now yeah 20 years later so much of that equipment is is probably you can buy it much better and cheaper and smaller kinds of stuff but i know that that you probably gonna have to use gas mass or have gas mass for for various kinds of gases and i'll tell you right now the way the source of that stuff is 3m i did a uh, bbc was going to do a program on uh, on caves of the world and they wanted to shoot down at, uh, at uh, Via Luz. And they, one of their assistant producers called me and they said, how do you guys afford to do this work? And I said, what do you mean? She says, well, we want to go in and film in the cave and we're going to have you know, like a, a camera person and a couple of uh, lighting people and carrying all the stuff. And she says, the only, only source we can find of, of mass to scrub out uh, H2S is from the British mine safety equipment. And each of the filters at that time were like 40, 35 or $40. And each mask had two of them. So she wanted to know how often you needed to change the filters. And I said, well, after about a, an hour or two. And she says, I don't think we can film this because the, the cost of the filters to be in the cave for a week to shoot this this thing with all of our staff, and then also the Sherpas to carry all the stuff in, you know, would be like prohibitive. And I said, well, I got my filters from 3M. And she says, how much were they? And I said, they're like, they're like five bucks a piece. <laughs> and she called me back uh, later that day and says, you saved me so much money. Do you want to come, well, the BBC will pay you to come along and be a safety and scientific consultant on the project. And I says, great. And she says, I said, when do you need to go? And she said, this was like Thursday. And she says, you need to fly out on Saturday. <laughs> and I said, okay. She said, well, just fly out, keep your ticket and we'll reimburse you after it was all over with. So, so I would for sure make sure you bring it, bring mass with you. Any other? <laughs> Well, with that, I close the official meeting of the Gathering of Naturalists, and I open it up to social convention now. If you want to talk to someone, unmute your mic <laughs> and go for it. <laughs>